Right, well, welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar on the management of farmland for wading birds. Uh, my name's Paul Chapman. I'm a conservation specialist with SEC Consulting, and I'm running this seminar in place of a meeting that we were due to hold last week um, in uh, Fingen near Bankery in Aberdeenshire, uh, but which unfortunately had to be um, canceled due to the coronavirus situation. Um, however, um, I have managed to include some photographs of some of the areas that we would have looked at during that meeting, um, and I'm grateful to the Fingen Estate for having been willing to hold a, to host us for that meeting um, and uh, allow me to include a few photos um, in this uh, online webinar. Uh, Fingen is a fantastic area on Dee side uh, with a, a very wide range of wildlife, but like much of the, the rest of Scotland, it's seen a dramatic declines in the numbers of uh, breeding wading birds in the past couple of decades. During the course of this webinar, we'll look at the reasons why we're concerned about waders, the reasons behind their declines, and what can be done about it. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along, if anything um, uh, you want to ask about, and I'll try and answer. There is a, a chat facility. I think all attendees by default are muted, but you can ask um, a question through the, the, the chat facility, and I can try to answer it um, uh, by speaking back. Um, or um, possibly may be able to unmute you if you wish to, to speak um, as part of the webinar, but do feel free to ask questions and I'll keep an eye on the uh, dashboard to see if any questions pop up. There are about 30 species of waders regularly occurring in Scotland, but um, most of them are winter visitors to the coast. And when we're talk, talking about waders and farming, we're generally speaking about five species. Lapwing, curlew, oyster catcher, snipe, and red shank. And out of these, it's really the curlew and the lapwing that are the key species that tend to attract the most interest from um, a conservation viewpoint. So the curlew is the largest of our waders, and its calls are evocative of upland areas in particular, although it is also found in the lowlands. It nests in May and June in tussocks of taller vegetation, such as rushes, or sometimes in grass grown for hay or silage. And the curlew has suffered the largest decline of any widespread and common bird species over the past quarter of a century in Scotland. It's declined by about 61% um, in that time. Um, in Ireland, it's suffered a 96% decline and is almost extinct. So um, while we're not quite as bad as uh, the situation there, um, it does show that things can, can change quite dramatically over relatively short periods of time. The lapwing, or uh, as it's known in many parts of Scotland, the peasy, um, is a, a much loved bird of farmland with its distinctive display flights and calls. Uh, it tends to arrive inland from late February and nest on short grass or arable fields, um, nesting with eggs on the ground in April and chicks generally hatching in May. And often nests in uh, in groups, sort of small colonies within fields in areas where it's still common. Over the last quarter of a century, the lapwing population has declined by more than a half. Uh, not quite as bad as the curlew, but still um, bad enough. And although there are still good numbers in some generally upland areas, in other areas they've more or less disappeared. And uh, the situation on the Fingen Estate, where we were ho hoping to hold the meeting, um, there is some data um, to show, um, to illustrate this decline. Um, back in 2006, uh, a survey was carried out of breeding waders um, throughout the um, arable areas of the estate and found 36 nesting territories of lapwings um, marked on this aerial photograph by the yellow dots. Only three years later, a repeat survey found that those 36 nesting territories had declined to 15. And you could see them shrinking down into um, certain fields. And then another four years down the line, it was down to just um, three pairs remaining in one um, small area of the estate. And since then, really only one or two pairs have nested in this area, the same sort of area since. And this sort of local data um, really brings home the way the national decline has affected these species at a local level. 
because this pattern will have been repeated in many areas where there isn't any survey data and as time passes it's easy for people maybe to forget that those birds were once there and they've now gone so um, people who maybe newly move into an area now might not realize that they were there before however it is important to just to note that not all wader species have shown such dramatic declines as the curlew and lapwing. The the oyster catcher and red shank have also declined, um, not perhaps quite as significantly as as the curlew and lapwing, but they have declined. But one species, the snipe, um, has actually increased in population over the past 25 years, and I'll maybe touch on why that may have been um, in in a later slide. Um, it's fluctuated up and down, but um, pretty much uh, stayed at least stable and if, if, if anything a slight um, increase in population level. But for species like the curlew and lapwing um, we have to ask why have they declined and unfortunately there's not one easily fixed reason that we can just go to and sort uh, the problem out. It's um, a combination of factors and in different areas certain factors may be more important than others um, but they're all part of a wider population and um, the, the birds in, in one area will be dependent on what's going on in the whole population. So even in areas where things are maybe better, if the surrounding areas have declined, it makes those remaining populations more vulnerable. But the key factors can be summarized um, as on that slide, um, and I'll go into them in a bit more detail in the following slides. So habitat changes, um, particularly to wetland features on the farm and the structure of wetland vegetation expansion of woodland and forestry which is beneficial for many other species and for um, carbon sequestration but it can be detrimental to waders and that's linked to the wider problem of predation to which ground nesting birds are particularly vulnerable. Nest destruction by agricultural activities has long been identified as a problem while more recently soil health and particularly populations of soil invertebrates the main food of waders has been recognized as being of um, increasing importance. So looking at habitat changes first, when you have wet areas like on this slide in, in, in fields, it's easy to see that as a problem from an agricultural viewpoint and want to get it back into good condition, maybe do some drainage um, and uh, get the grass growing better. But for wading birds, even small patches of wet ground like this can be really important feeding areas. Although farmland waders will spend a lot of their time on dry ground, arable fields and um, uh, hay meadows, silage fields, by their nature they are wetland birds and even if they don't nest in a wet area like this, they will feed in it looking for invertebrates and when their chicks hatch they'll bring them to places like that um, from nesting areas that may be even a few hundred meters away. And by draining areas like that, the ability of waders in the surrounding area to raise sufficient young to maintain the population um, can easily be compromised if that was a key area for, for those species in that, um, in that particular area. Apart from wetland drainage, deterioration of vegetation structure is probably the other main habitat change that's detrimental to waders. Although occasionally overgrazing may be a problem, in most cases the problem is um, quite the reverse. It's a lack of grazing in wetland areas, leading to a growth of tall, dense vegetation of rushes and similar vegetation. Um, areas that are maybe too difficult to drain often will just get fenced off or left and abandoned and forgotten about, uh, or at least very rarely grazed, and end up in this sort of condition. There's no harm in having areas like this. They are good for things like snipe. Um, the wetland area in that photograph was, is used every year by breeding snipe. And it's also important for other wetland birds and also for wetland plants. But if all the wetland areas on the farm are like this, then there'll be very little value to species like lapwing and curlew, um, which prefer much more open vegetation. A mosaic of short grass um, interspersed with tussocks of grass or rush for cover um, looking like um, this habitat in the slide here is really the ideal vegetation for the widest range of, of wader species. So um, curlew, snipe, red shank will tend to nest in the taller more tussocky areas where they can hide away 
and keep their nests concealed, while lapwings and oyster catchers prefer to nest in the shorter, shorter grass um, where they have a good all-round view of any approaching danger, um, predators and so on. Another thing that could possibly be classed under deterioration of vegetation structure, I suppose, in its broadest term, is um, the loss of arable cropping from many livestock uh, farming areas. So lapwings and oyster catchers in particular show um, a very strong preference for cultivated land in the springtime when they're choosing their nest sites. Uh, they like um, the bare ground to nest in again so they can see dangers um, uh, approaching from all round. So spring cultivated crops in particular are the key thing. Winter crops, um, not so good because by the time um, these birds are nesting, the, the vegetation will already be quite tall and won't give them that all round view. So having nested maybe in a, in a, a spring barley field or, or something similar like that, um, when the, the chicks of the lapwing or the oyster catcher hatch, if there's some nearby pasture with wet areas, then the adults will take the chicks to those areas. And that provides really an ideal landscape for these species. So they really benefit from the kind of traditional farming, um, uh, sort of diverse mixture of cropped land and um, uh, pasture and wet areas. Um, which has tended to become less common in recent years as, as farming tend to specialise towards more um, grass-based systems or all cropped systems, but the sort of um, the mixed systems that maintain a, a, a bit of everything um, have become less common. And certainly for, for birds like the lapwing, I'm sure that's um, a, a, an important factor in the in the decline that's that's happened. Another thing that we could class under deterioration of uh, the, the sort of vegetation structure at a, at a larger scale is um, is uh, the, the the increase in woodland and forestry. And here we've got to really take a landscape view of the habitat um, for waders because they are birds of open farmland and will use several different types of habitat in close proximity. Maybe some for nesting in, some for feeding in. Um, but the one habitat that they don't use and usually avoid is woodland and forestry. Of course, woodland is a fantastic habitat for a lot of species and is important in our efforts to um, combat climate change through carbon capture and so on. But if woodland is created next to or even worse in the middle of some good wader habitat, then species like lapwing and curlew will tend to abandon those areas um, once the trees start to grow up. Um, above a certain height. Um, and the reason for this is that these birds, they are birds of open open landscapes because they, they recognize trees and woodlands as habitats that could be harboring um, predators um, that will come and uh, prey on their um, nests and chicks. Uh, fortunately, nowadays, when it comes to new a lot, particularly larger new forestry planting scheme, Scottish Forestry, the, the government agency that regulates um, uh, forestry um, in, in Scotland, um, tends to insist that any new forestry planting sites are surveyed for waders, um, particularly curlews and lapwings, um, before they can go ahead. But um, perhaps we could make the case that we need maybe more strategic approach um, and identify where the important wader are, areas are up front so that um, we can uh, form a, a sort of um, framework for where tree planting is going to be beneficial and not have these um, potentially detrimental effects on some of the most important areas for waders before it gets to the, the this stage of um, individual proposals. And that leads on to the um, wider issue of predation and its impacts on waders. Um, it's uh, certainly um, when we tend to hold meetings, um, this is one of the, the, the topics that tends to generate the most discussion. Um, sometimes it can be controversial, but um, there is um, no, no doubt the science is there about the impact of predation on waders. It, it's almost certainly the case that um, habitat changes, changes in farming systems have maybe been the initial driver behind a lot of um, declines in waders, but 
Um, now that we um, populations have been reduced to much lower levels, um, predation is undoubtedly one of the main threats to the, the remaining populations. Um, a lot of research has been done on, on this um, in a number of countries, uh, particularly on species like lapwing and curlew, and uh, things like using um, remote cameras on nest sites, temperature loggers, um, that type of thing. And uh, what that research has tended to show time and again is that predation on waders is of the, the, the key times are when the eggs are in the nest and vulnerable, and then when the chicks are small before they, they're fledged and are, are vulnerable to be to be eaten as well. And what the research has shown is that the predation of eggs primarily occurs um, during the night time, um, and uh, that tends to point to the, the predators being mammals, which hunt at night rather than birds, which are mostly well, predatory birds, which are mostly diurnal. Um, and certainly a lot of the camera trap evidence shows that it's it's mammals that are prim primarily taking eggs from nests. And the fox is um, generally um, the, the main threat in most situations, in most areas. Once um, those eggs that have survived hatch, um, then there's a range of predators that can prey, prey on them, both nocturnal and diurnal. It's a bit more difficult to do the research um, uh, once the, the eggs have hatched because the, the young are immediately mobile and moving around and, and not necessarily easy to follow. Um, but there's no doubt there's a range of um, uh, mammal and bird predators as well, things like crows, um, uh, particularly important predators on, on uh, wader chicks in many areas. Of course, there is also the issue of protected predators. Um, it's not just the uh, the um, less well protected predators that prey on um, on waders, but other ones do as well. Uh, we don't always know the full extent of this. Certainly, as I say, the research has tended to usually point to foxes and crows as the main uh, culprits, as it were. Um, but um, there's no doubt that protected birds of prey, buzzards and kites will opportunistically take um, particularly well take chicks um, uh, if they spot them in amongst the grass. A lot of areas, um, there's a lot of discussion about what impact badgers may have on, on ground nesting birds. Um, uh, it's maybe particularly on waders, it's, it's something that maybe needs a bit more research to see just exactly what um, those levels of impacts are and also things like ravens um, can also um, be predators of these species. Um, and obviously it's more difficult to, whereas with foxes and crows, you can carry out predator control um, uh, legally. Um, with these species, it's more difficult um, if there are impacts there. However, I would say it is quite important to, um, to note that waders can tolerate a certain level of predation of eggs and chicks. Um, lapwings and curlews are relatively long-lived birds, maybe live, you know, 20 years or something like that, and um, they lay typically four eggs each year. Um, but for a long-lived bird like that, most of those species need to, um, in, in terms of what they need to survive each year to, to replace the adults that are lost, it's about 0 0.6 fledged chicks per pair each year on average. So if a typical pair of lapwings or curlews lays four eggs a year, 85% of those could be lost at the egg or chick stage without necessarily leading to population decline, um, but leaving that 0 0.6 per pair that's needed to keep the population stable. The problem is, of course, that in many cases nowadays, the predation levels are higher than that. So um, they are contributing to the declines. So as well as um, predation, um, wader nests are also vulnerable to um, destruction by agricultural activities. So um, various activities can have, have this effect on them. Trampling by livestock um, uh, can be an issue, um, uh, particularly where the livestock are in at high densities. Uh, destruction during cultivation. Um, rolling and mowing operations can all have an impact. 
over recent decades, of course, um, tractors have tended to become larger and faster, and the cabs are maybe higher off the ground, more isolated from uh, the, the surrounding environment a bit. Um, in many cases, um, farmers are having to use contractors, outside contractors, to come and do many of many of the operations. And those contractors, through no fault of their own, may not necessarily be aware of what's nesting in a field in the way that um, um, an individual farmer might have known when they were doing um, that type of work themselves. So there is probably an increased risk of this type of ac accidental damage um, just because people are maybe less aware of, of what's in the field. If nests are destroyed early on in the season, the birds can relay and lay a second clutch. Um, but if it's later in the season, then they may not have the chance to do that. Uh, so things like the timing of cultivation, um, the timing of hay and silage cutting are all critical. Um, lapwings tend to um, be sitting on their nests uh, generally during the month of April, typically, and into the beginning of May. Uh, generally, the first chicks will start hatching out in the, the first uh, first few days of May in much of Scotland. Um, that's the first nests. Obviously, if they relay, then that will be um, later on in the season. Um, curlews, which tend to seek out taller vegetation for um, uh, nesting, tend to late, wait, wait a bit later in the season while the vegetation's grown up a bit um, more to provide them with that cover. Um, so they may well be um, nesting into May and June time. and. In some areas, curlews will seek out um, hay or silage fields to nest in. And obviously, if those are being cut in May or June, then any curlew nests in those fields can be vulnerable to, to silage cutting. Um, and really, any sort of silage cutting before um, really July can be um, detrimental to any curlews that might be nesting there. The final important factor that I wanted to, to cover in discussing wader declines is one that's um, got quite a bit more attention recently. People have been um, talking about it a bit more, looking into it, and that's the, the wider issue of soil health. Um, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on maintaining your soils for all, all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, right, I'll just briefly stop there. I see uh, Davy McCracken has asked a question here. Uh, Davy, as some of you may know, is a colleague who is um, involved with the Working for Waders initiative. And uh, this is referring back to what I was saying about uh, forestry. Um, and um, Working for Waders is, um, is trying to identify these key wader habitat areas in association with Scottish forestry um, to try and uh, make sure they're taken account of in uh, in more strategic thinking about forestry creation. So uh, thanks for that, Davy. Right, coming back to soil health. Um, as I said, we're um, quite interested in soil health for quite a number of reasons, for um, you know, healthy crops, healthy livestock, for carbon capture, all sorts of things. But um, for things like wading birds that are feeding on uh, invertebrates that they're picking up from from either the surface or in the case of curlews from in the soil then obviously the um, the the life within the soil is of critical importance um, because that's the food uh, for most of these species um, in particularly in more maybe more marginal farming areas in the uplands it's thought there's been a, a reduction um, in lime and manure applications to farmland and the resulting reduction in soil organic matter and pH um, can reduce the number of soil invertebrates such as worms um, that the waders are feeding on. Generally speaking, if the um, uh, pH drops below about 5.5, uh, something like that, then um, worm populations can start to be significantly um, affected. And it's thought that this could be quite a key factor in some upland areas um, where maybe the intensity of farming is not um, so much of a problem, but it's more the um, the, the, the soil isn't providing the, the food um, that these um, these uh, birds need. So sorry, that probably all seems quite negative in a way, um, looking at the reasons for the declines, but 
it is important that we know why these birds are in trouble in order to uh, try to stem the decline and hopefully even um, reverse it. Um, so by understanding the problems, we can think about the solutions. And it really kind of boils down to, to three broad things that we can do. Um, the first is creating high quality habitat for feeding and nesting. Um, the better the quality of the habitat, then um, the, 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 maybe the, the, the less some of the other factors come into play. Uh, so we need to look, think about the habitat. We need to try to keep nesting sites safe from accidental destruction um, from agriculture. And we need to try to keep um, the predation pressure um, low as far as we can do that um, in practical terms. So in wet grassland habitats, um, where there's an issue with um, rush, rushes growing quite vigorously in a lot of, of areas that still have um, good populations of wading birds, this is a, is a major concern is that the rush is tending to get um, out of control. Um, uh, in these areas, um, doing topping of the rushes is, is quite an important um, uh, method for keeping the vegetation reasonably open. And then of course, combining that with appropriate levels of grazing um, to uh, create the sort of mosaic of different vegetation types, including plenty of short grass, which um, a lot of these um, birds love to feed on um, and, and find their prey. Um, so um, uh, rush cutting is really important. Of course, rushes can be, as well as being indicative of um, uh, of wet conditions, which you, you want for waders. Um, they can also maybe indicate lower pH conditions. So maybe some liming can also help in, in um, keeping the, uh, the rush levels uh, a, a wee bit lower. By getting the grazing levels right, um, the ground needs to be, it needs to be grazed reasonably well to keep the vegetation short and, and things like kind of hoof prints and things in wet ground, you know, that might not look like very much, but these sorts of areas um, uh, can can provide little areas of shelter for small chicks to, to hide in, um, protect them from uh, the, the weather, which is one thing we maybe haven't spoken about and which may also be a critical factor is, is climate and weather, wet conditions when the chicks hatch windy conditions, cold, um, but these the things like little hoof prints from grazing livestock create little um, niches where these, these birds can, can shelter um, and potentially find some shelter from predators as well. Um, but of course, it's important during, particularly during the egg period when the birds are sitting on the nests, it's important to um, keep the the, the, the stocking rate low enough that there's not a risk of trampling. Um, and certainly you maybe be wanting to look at less than one livestock unit per hectare during those key periods in April and May. Um, but then again, it is important to have enough grazing at the other times of the year to keep the vegetation um, under control and not getting too overgrown. Wet areas on the farm, something that we have a certain amount of control over. If you have existing wet areas on the farm, then keeping those um, to uh, provide your feeding habitat for, for waders is really important. Um, but also um, trying to create new wet areas might go against the grain for um, in terms of agricultural production, but creating uh, new areas of wetlands is also important, um, particularly if if uh, wetlands have been lost historically, and particularly if you're trying to attract waders back to areas where they had previously been but have since been lost, because when um, waders, uh, lapwings, oyster catchers, curlews, when they when they um, return to their breeding areas in the spring from being at the coast in the winter time, they will often seek out areas of standing water, wet areas to congregate, and if it looks like a decent breeding habitat roundabout, they may stay and, and carry on breeding. So so creating um, sort of wetland areas is um, is an important way that we can improve the habitat. Um, and one uh, type of sort of wetland creation that's um, seen a lot of um, attention through agri-environment schemes is uh, the creation of what we call wader scrapes. Um, and a wader scrape is, is simply a, a sort of shallow um, 
a sort of hollow within a field, which is, um, as the name um, sort of describes, may, may have been scraped out by a digger or whatever um, into the water table to create um, a shallow, uh, uh, we're talking about really shallow water here, maybe just a few centimetres deep, uh, certainly not more than maybe 30, 40, 50 centimetres deep in the middle, and with really um, uh, gently sloping edges um, where with plenty of uh, short vegetation, again, the mosaic of vegetation coming right up to the edge of the uh, of the scrape so that birds can come down to the edge of the water and, and probe in the in the wet mud. Um, that's uh, that's found around the edges of these pools, um, and and these these areas only really have to be wet during the um, uh, the sort of spring and into the early summer. If they dry up later in the year, that doesn't matter because by then, hopefully, the waders will have um, nested uh, successfully, and um, the, they won't need those areas so much. Um, in any case, a lot of the wading birds tend to depart from their breeding areas uh, fairly early in the summer, maybe in July or um, that uh, type of uh, time. Right, I'm just having a look at the um, panel again. We've got another question. Um, what is the appropriate stocking rate per hectare on wet grasslands? Um, yeah, it, 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 it's difficult to say in terms of an overall stocking rate. Um, I mean, obviously, during the during the key period, if um, uh, lapwings or or other waders are nesting on the field, you do want to keep keep it as low as as you practically can. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a total exclusion of livestock, although if you if you do keep stock off sort of um, March April, then um, that that that's all great. But um, uh, while there is a trampling risk associated with grazing livestock, if it's at a low level of, of stocking, it shouldn't um, matter too much if we're talking about, you know, a um, couple of sheep a, he a hectare or something like that. The risk's probably pretty low. You probably wouldn't want to go too much higher than that, really, during that period. But after that, um, you can really, you can graze these areas quite, quite hard. I wouldn't think it was a good idea to um, immediately turn out uh, you know, as soon as your your nesting periods, um, you think your your egg sitting period is is ended. You don't want to turn out huge numbers of livestock onto the field and 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 swamp the field in case there are some late nesting pairs there that are at risk of trampling. But gradually building the numbers up, and then um, you do probably really want to 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 graze it reasonably hard, and and that'll depend very much on the productivity of of the fields because you want by the the sort of end of the the following winter and the start of the next breeding season, you want quite a lot of good short cropped grass interspersed with some patches of, of taller vegetation. So um, it's really just in that um, period when when they're likely to be sitting on eggs that it's it's critical to keep um, keep the numbers low. Um, if you're looking at um, lapwings and oyster catchers in areas that are now dominated by grass-based agriculture, you could um, you could consider the possibility of reintroducing some spring cultivation to, um, particularly if it's close to, to wetland areas or good wader habitat. This could be particularly valuable in areas where there really isn't much um, cultivation going on anymore. And that doesn't necessarily mean going and trying to grow a cereal crop, which could be challenging in some areas, but um, it could be something that you could do in association with growing a forage crop or, um, or even reseeding a grass field. Um, if if the ground's ploughed up in in the late winter and and um, uh, cultivated um, and then left during the key nesting period in April and then um, it could be sown in in uh, in in sort of from mid May onwards once the nesting period's hopefully passed. Right, we have another question. The minimum practical distance between a wetland habit, habitat and an area of forestry or woodland. Um, it's it's kind of a, a difficult one to give a give an, a a single figure. It depends a little bit um, on uh, on a sort of case by case uh, situation, but um, there is a there are some various sort of figures that are bandied around in in, in guidance, um, and it's sometimes difficult to to figure out where they've come from. But um, uh, one figure that's often quoted is that wading birds. Are reluctant to to nest within about thirty meters of a of a woodland edge or something like that. Um, uh, but um, 
so you tend to try to keep habitats you know at least 30 meters away from 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 sort of um, woodland edges but if you had a small field and it was surrounded on all four sides by woodland then um, I don't think that 30 meters would be enough because you'd have just a small island in the middle all completely surrounded by woodland so um, there are various uh, another figure that's that's sometimes I've seen in the literature is is that um, there's a sort of predation risk um, within a sort of 400 meter um, distance from woodland edge um, again not quite sure what exactly that's based on science wise but um, uh, but generally um, you you would I, I did do a little bit of analysis of, of, of a few sites of waders and measuring the um, the proportion of fields that were used by waders um, that was within say 30 meters of forestry or woodland edge and what we found was that um, once the proportion of the field that was within 30 meters of a woodland edge got up above sort of 25 percent then waders tended not to use them um, and the, the, the ones that waders preferred were the ones where you were down at sort of five to ten percent of the field was within 30 meters of, of the woodland edge so you, you're probably needing a, a sort of good open area of maybe at least probably 10 hectares um, before waders will maybe use them. Um, but really, the bigger and more open, the better, generally. Right, the questions are coming in thick and uh, fast, but I shall just uh, have a look. Um, right, there's one that I'll go back to later. Right, then uh, we have another question from Richard Lockett about ploughing lapwing nesting plots in in ploughing them in wet grassland. Oh, that's quite an interesting um, uh, idea. Right, so yeah, I mean, the, the lapwing plots, as I'm sure Richard, you'll know, are um, something that they seem to do quite a lot of in, in, in England, and um, but generally in, in sort of more, um, I think, arable uh, areas. So I don't personally have any experience with that. It'd be quite an interesting experiment to do. Um, Minimum size of plots, I don't know. I, th I, I think you maybe would need to be looking at sort of 20, 30 meters across minimum, but that, that's just a guess. I wouldn't like to be 100% uh, uh, sure about that, but it'd be interesting to know how you get on with that. And we've got another question from Rachel about the key dates for nesting and vulnerable chicks. So generally speaking, um, well, for lapwings, they're probably mostly nesting in well, they'll start laying eggs maybe in 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 early April, um, early to mid April, and so the sort of month of April, particularly the latter part of April into early May, is the key period for the the eggs. Uh, the ne the the eggs will tend to hatch maybe in early May, typically um, maybe the first second week of May, and then how long are the chicks vulnerable for? Well, I guess it's um, as time goes on, you know, it might be probably the, the chicks will be around for a, a month or two before they're able to to sort of move away. Um, but obviously, when they are first hatched in, in early to mid-May, they're going to be very vulnerable because they're very small and there's a wider range of things that can pick up a tiny chick compared to picking up a, a bigger chick. So um, as time goes on, or probably once you get into June, um, maybe the risk is hopefully starting to, to decrease. Curlews nesting later, um, generally speaking, um, I would say kind of May, June uh, time, uh, they could be on nests. Um, generally speaking, we would we would advise certainly for, for mowing grass fields with um, curlews in them that you would really want to be leaving that till the end of June before cutting. All right. So yeah, creating some arable ground is um, be quite an interesting thing to try if it's if it's practical. Um, uh, and delaying the sowing um, until till mid May if it's something like grass reseed or, or a forage crop. Maintaining your soils is, uh, as I've mentioned before, is, is, a, is a key thing. Try get get your pH tested of, of your fields. I've seen a lot of of um, fields being managed for waders that look habitat wise they look really good, and then you think, well, why aren't the waders here? There may be a lot of reasons for that, but one thing I think it would be worth always doing is checking what is the pH and if the pH is is very low uh, think about liming the field to try and and get that um, 
up and and boost the organic matter maybe with some farmyard manure if that's available to um, uh, to try and get those soil invertebrates going. And then finally, of course, um, predator control is likely to be essential in in most cases. Um, legal control of crows and foxes is is the key thing, and doing that in the early spring period, sort of maybe from January, February onwards, um, so that the the, the predators are, are are not there when the the birds are settling into nest, but keeping it going through into to sort of May um, time, so uh, to minimise that impact. It's uh, although predator control may be important for, for waders, it isn't always that easy to uh, to achieve. Um, uh, obviously, on on um, big estates, uh, sporting estates, then there'll often be gamekeepers there doing that job anyway. So uh, that's dealt with. On a lot of lowland farmland now, th there aren't keepers um, and farmers are pretty busy doing other things and they may want to control um, predators but they may not have the time to do it and they may not have the the funds to um, uh, to employ someone else to do it and also if you're employing someone else to do it you're taking some responsibility for how they're carrying it out and, and making sure they're um, uh, abiding by the law so it's maybe an easy thing to talk about predator control but not necessarily easy um, to to carry out in the in the case of, uh, and Davy has asked a question about the um, the intended host estate. Um, uh, they do have a, a, a sporting interest. Um, they do a bit of pheasant shooting and um, um, some grouse on the hill and things like that. So they do employ a full-time gamekeeper, um, and there is quite intensive um, fox control. Um, uh, uh, quite a uh, quite a, a large number of foxes, I think, are taken. Um, uh, most years, but um, and that keeps um, certainly keeps the fox predation low, and also um, crows. One thing that has increased um, in recent years, um, which uh, it's difficult to judge exactly what the impact is, is, is um, rooks and jackdaws. There's a lot more rooks and jackdaws around, and often feeding in the fields um, that the waders have used um, in the past, um, and it's. <sighs> It's, it's, it's difficult to know because I mean there's not a lot of science to to, to say what, what you know how how big a predator of of, of wader eggs are rooks and jackdaws. Um, you, you might think that um, they would certainly not turn their nose up or turn their beak up at a at an egg, but um, there's not a lot of science there to see what the impact is. But there may be other impacts. It may be if you've got 50 rooks feeding um, in a field that then that just puts off um, wading birds from settling in them because they just don't like having all those other birds around. Um, so it may not be a direct impact of predation. It might just be not liking um, those birds being present. So um, so predator control is, um, is certainly difficult um, uh, to achieve and particularly on small farms where you really need to probably do the, the, the predator control over a larger area, and really, you almost need a sort of collaborative um, project uh, for, for, um, to to deliver that in in some areas. So um, it's an easy one to talk about, but possibly a less easy one to deliver. Um, there have been some innovative um, approaches to predator control by um, uh, people like RSPB on some of their nature reserves for for waders. So they've um, done a lot of work developing the use of predator-proof fencing electric fencing and that sort of thing to keep um, predators out of um, areas that are used by nesting waders. Um, these have an advantage that, of course, because they're not only effective against um, uh, foxes, um, but they're also um, potentially effective against uh, protected species like badgers um, without necessarily breaking the law. Um, they can stop um, uh, some of those predators going into to nesting fields, but can be quite an expensive job to do this sort of predator-proof fencing, and it's probably only going to be a practical option, even remotely, um, in areas where there are um, quite high concentrations of waders or potential for high concentrations of waders in a fairly small area that can be protected. So probably not that practical for the wider um, farmland uh, situation, but in some cases um, it could work. Right, so we're getting towards the end of the presentation now, but um, I just want to talk a little bit about 
support schemes for um, um, wader conservation. So support for a lot of these measures has been available through agri-environment schemes uh, for quite a few years with options like wader grazed grassland, which involves um, stocking rate restrictions at key times of the year, wader mown grassland, which involves late cutting of, of hay and silage, grants for, for rush cutting where it's required and creation of wader scrapes has been available through, um, through these schemes. Um, but it hasn't always necessarily delivered the results you might want um, in terms of coordinating those um, options in the sort of ideal combination uh, for, for waders. Um, in any case, the current agri-environment scheme is, is closed this year for new applications, but support um, in one form or another is likely to be available again in the future. Um, and Scottish Natural Heritage are also developing some ideas for new types of agri-environment support for wading birds um, based on payments for delivering outcomes rather than following rigid prescriptions, which has been the case up until now in, in a lot of the schemes. When we talk about outcome-based um, payments, we're not necessarily meaning that you get paid directly for the number of waders that you have on your farm, but it's more maybe um, scoring the quality of the habitat that um, you've created for, for waders and giving you higher payments, the better the quality, the more boxes that it, 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 that patch of habitat ticks in terms of wetland areas, in terms of um, vegetation structure and whether there's predator control and that sort of thing. That's the type of thing that, that might, might be looked at. Um, and that gives potentially the farmer a bit more flexibility as to how they deliver that rather than saying, I have to have X number of cattle in that field at this time and X number at that, and they've got to be out on this date and in at that date. It, it, it makes it less rigid and more flexible, but and allows people to use their, their own ideas and innovation to, to deliver uh, the benefits that are desired. But realistically, that's it's something that may be piloted in the next next couple of years, but it, it, it's not something that's probably going to be appearing sort of immediately, but certainly in, in the years to come, that might be the direction that things are moving. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, if you would like to learn a bit more, um, please visit um, the Farm Advisory Service website and search for waders and you'll find a technical note and some videos uh, with further information about waders. Please also mention the, uh, please, please also visit the Working for Waders website, which I've already mentioned. This is a collaborative project bringing together a wide range of organizations, government bodies, individuals working together to reverse the decline of waders and share um, practical experience of, of working to um, conserve them. And if you're interested in some of the more detailed science behind wader conservation, you might find the online Wader Tales blog quite interesting. And yeah, please uh, uh, look at look at some of these resources and uh, I'm sure you'll find something of, of, of interest. I see a, another comment from Davy here about um, Relating back to the, um, the the fact that agri-environment schemes are currently on pause for this year at any rate, um, but the biodiversity crisis is is uh, recognised as being um, as important as the climate emergency. So Davy's confident, and I would be too, that um, environmental payments for wader conservation will definitely return, and hopefully in an improved uh, manner. So. So that really brings things to an end. Um, if you have any final questions, please feel free to um, get in touch through the, that que uh, question function. Um, I'll remain online for a little while in case there are any further queries, um, but otherwise, thank you very much for joining me and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>